my name is Jason Freeman, and I'm pleased to join you here to introduce tonight's guest, Emma Copley Eisenberg. Emma Copley Eisenberg is the author of The Third Rainbow Girl, The Long Life of a Double Murder in Appalachia, the chronicle of a long reverberating 1980 double murder in a remote area of West Virginia, where I also happen to have gone to Boy Scout camp as a boy, but that's a story for another evening. A New York Times notable book, it was nominated for an Edgar Award, a Lambda Literary Award, and an Anthony Award, among other honors. Her short fiction has appeared in such periodicals as Granta, McSweeney's Slate, and Tin House, and she is the co-founder of the Philadelphia-based Blue Stoop, a community hub for the literary arts. Who here is not from Blue Stoop tonight? Just, okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm only about to have, okay. Um, she joins us tonight with her novel, Housemates, a celebration of queer life, art, and chosen family amidst the turmoil of contemporary America. This debut novel follows two roomies on a road trip through rural Pennsylvania. Tonight's author will be in conversation with Jennifer Wilson, a contributing writer at The New Yorker. She previously was a contributing essay essayist at the New York Times Book Review, where she covered trends in, liter in contemporary fiction. In 2022, she received the Nona Balakian Citation for Excellence in Reviewing from the National Book Critics Circle. In 2024, she was awarded the Robert B. Silvers Prize for Literary Criticism. She has a PhD in Slavic languages and literatures and frequently writes about books by writers from Russia, UK, Ukraine, and Belarus, as well as the relationship between culture and political economy. She also teaches cultural reporting and criticism at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. Philadelphia, please join me in welcoming tonight's guests. Um, so good to see so many faces I love in this audience. And I want to say thanks to Jen for taking a train to come here, a nice Amtrak. And I want to say um, thanks to The Claw, my writing pals, yeah, for keeping um, me sane and hydrated and full of cheese. Uh, and I want to say thank you to my partner, Art, for being the official housemates photographer. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, so I'm so excited, this day is finally here, first event, pub day, excited, um, yeah, I know, ringing it in with Philadelphia, and I'm um, very appreciative of you all coming tonight, I, I just feel like there's so much um, happening, so much on our brains and hearts, and every time we make space to prioritize a book or a work of culture, that feels like kind of a miracle, so thank you so much. Um, and I warn you that I may cry because that's where I am in my emotional journey today. So this is a <laughs> crying, posy space. And after this, we're gonna um, all are invited, even if I don't know you personally, to um, the Cherry Street Tavern for a drink. Um, so come out if you would like. So I wrote this book with a question in mind. Um, can art save your life? The answer is of course yes and no. I felt strongly I wanted to write a book about living, about life. It feels essential to acknowledge that as I stand here as a writer and a human and a Jew, people are being murdered in Gaza. No book will save their lives nor any statement. But just because it bears repeating, let this book be one book on a big stack of books that have been written or have yet to be written that says more life, less death, ceasefire now, in our lifetime, Palestine will be free. Okay, so thank you again for holding all the things. Okay, I'm gonna read you a little something and then Jen and I will chat and then we will all chat. So the only thing I think you need to know for this to make sense is that there's kind of a mysterious eye who is sort of like a fairy tale eye, maybe, just kind of like pops in and out, and it's okay if you don't really know what's happening there. I don't really either. <laughs> All interpretations are valid. Okay, thank you. Okay, the day Bernie met Leah was bright white and dying. 
It was a Saturday in January, so the block's many trees, roots wrecking the sidewalk as they grew, were bare, their branches lolling in the wind. There had recently been a fire at the old Apple factory building that burned for days, despite the best efforts of those responsible for its extinguishment, so the smell of ash still hung in the air. They met because of the house, a three-story Victorian managed by a suburban rental company that sat on the white end of a block that marked the edge of gentrification. To the east, intrepid white queers bundled their tiny offspring into snowsuits and strapped them into all-terrain baby carriages. To the west, black women knocked and stood in door frames talking with the storm doors open. To the south was the avenue, a commercial corridor that connected this neighborhood on one side to the university via expensive pizza restaurants and local pet stores and the co-op grocery store <laughs> and a sprawling green park that hosted a farmer's market. And on the other side, to the suburbs via Ethiopian restaurants, hair salons, and car dealerships decorated with strings of multicolored flags. To the north was the subway Bernie had taken to get here, a train that went both below and above ground, hurtling by murals that conveyed messages of love and color and caution. Bangs combed and wearing a cheap blue blazer that was too big for her, Bernie stood in front of the house's huge door with its great pane of glass and horizontal mail slot. Attached to its neighbor on one side, but separated on the other by a damp alley, the house's front garden, which sloped steeply, was a graveyard of limp hostas, and its porch a parking lot for bikes. Bernie had never heard of a housing interview, but the person she'd been emailing with... <laughs> Thank you, please laugh. Um, <laughs> assured her that it was important to make sure it was the right fit for everybody's sake. Four Swarthmore grads looking for a fifth housemate, the ad read. Looking for someone with emo excellent emotional processing skills. <laughs> An ability to engage in open dialogue and proactive communication. We use a chore wheel to make sure labor is distributed equitably. Must be into Jigger the Cat, most important member of the household, ha ha ha. And anti-racist. Queer preferred, parentheses, we all are. Okay, let's skip ahead a little bit. Um, West Philly, with its old deciduous trees and earnest leftist infighting, had not been Bernie's first choice. <laughs> As she preferred the hard drinking and emotionally suppressed culture of her previous neighborhood, South Philly. Um, <laughs> But, but as the move out date approached and she sent reply after reply on the roommate wanted website with no result, she began to see the situation somewhat differently. Bernie rang the bell, then rapped sharply on the pane. She heard a person approach the door, then stop. In the long pause that followed, Bernie perceived the anxiety of whoever was on the other side, their hesitation palpable, their heavy breathing audible. The door opened. Big smile, both hands waving, plump face framed by a haircut that seemed made for an old-fashioned hat to sit on top of it. A trapezoidal duke's hat, perhaps, in a deep color or a round page's cap with a feather in it. Her forehead was wet. Her name, she said, was Leah. Come in, Leah said, then stepped back so Bernie could. She spoke loud, so loud it was jarring, but also winning. Bernie had never been one to make fun of those who tried very hard at life, as she herself was also such a person. Leah leaned forward, pulled the big door closed, and locked it. They stood in the small vestibule looking at each other. Bernie, Bernie said, pointing to herself. I know, Leah said. I mean, I figured. Leah shook her hair out of her eyes like a boy in a swimming pool. She was big. Big breasts atop big stomach, atop thighs and men's khaki pants big long legs that terminated in round-toed soccer sneakers. So gay. Black with white stripes. Cheeks like huge apples that shone in the weak overhead light. Nose a little pointy and downtrodden. She wore a red hoodie, the zipper of which was sliding down and revealing interesting freckles. Well, Leah said, shall we? Bernie followed Leah into the dim living room, which connected to the dim dining room via a large cased opening. Light filtered in weakly through the alley side windows, and several gooseneck lamps, all plugged tautly into the same outlet, made futile attempts at illumination. A shiny exposed brick wall ran the length of the dining room and on into the fluorescent lit kitchen, which Bernie glimpsed through a narrow door. Small bits had come unsealed from the brick wall and tumbled down onto the dark hardwood floors, which shone aggressively, even in the absence of light. Meow, meow, 
said a warm black and white lump of cat <laughs> who appeared at Bernie's shins and then bumped her head against Bernie's ankle bone. Bernie's pants were slightly too short and her socks had slunk down into bunches so the cat's velvet fur was shockingly soft against her bare skin. The cat lifted her small face, closed her eyes, and began to purr in Bernie's general direction. She then turned her substantial rump on Bernie, exposing her pink asshole, all the more prominent against her black lustrous fur, and flopped onto the floor, where she began to hoist her opposite leg into the air and lick herself vigorously from primordial pouch to chewed back paw. I see you meant jigger, Ilya said. <laughs> there was that smile again, no teeth, but a joy all through the forehead and eyes. The three housemates who had filed into the dining room behind Leah all laughed. Leah had written the ad, but it was her girlfriend, Alex, a tall white girl with flat olive-colored limbs and brown hair gathered in a small knot at the nape of her neck who took on the role of lead questioner. Once all the housemates had been introduced and settled themselves around the table with their mugs of chamomile and lemon zinger, Bernie sat alone on the table's short side with her back to the front door, a thing that made her jumpy and paranoid. Her father believed he had been shot in the back in a past life, and this information, if it was information, had been passed down to Bernie. <laughs> Leah and Alex sat on Bernie's left. To her right was Violet, tall and narrow, with short dyed platinum blonde hair and black roots, and then Mina, who wore an electric pink mesh tank top that showed off her substantial arm muscles and looked moist, as if she had just come in from the rain. How do you feel about public education? Alex asked now. <laughs> Good, Bernie replied. <laughs> Charter schools, Alex continued. Good? Hmm, Alex said. <laughs> <laughs> Writing this down on a yellow legal pad. Alex is a journalist, Leah said, by way of explanation. You say that like you aren't a journalist too, Alex said. I'm not, Leah said. Not really. Right, Alex said. You're much too complicated to be boxed in. Exactly, Leah smiled. Mommy and Daddy are fighting, faux whined Violet. Leah and Alex turned and smiled at each other, and Leah patted Alex's skinny knee. How do you identify, asked Mina. Like my pronouns, Bernie answered. Yep, but also like any other words you might want us to know that describe your identities, like working class, disabled, butch, femme, witch, poly, pansexual, sapiosexual, bottom, top, boy, stud. Jesus, Mina, you can't say stud, interjected Violet, <laughs> rolling their eyes at Bernie conspiratorially. Really, Mina said. Really, white people and Asians should not say it because it's a word that comes from the black community. Hmm, Alex said, writing this down. <laughs> I am a woman, I guess, Bernie said. Actually, I prefer the word girl to the word woman, if I'm being honest. What about social justice, Alex asked. Approximately how many hours per week would you say you spend working to mitigate the effects of racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, or classism? Or fatphobia, Leah added. Yes, Alex said that too. Well, when I was younger, in college maybe, Bernie said, but now I work a lot, so I don't have a lot of free time. And you're a photographer, Alex said. We Googled you, Leah said. I, Violet said, did not Google you. <laughs> we looked at your photos of the river, Alex said. Ancient history, said Bernie. They were interesting, Alex said. Not a lot of people in them. A bit cold, maybe, almost clinical. Like for an architecture magazine, as if they were from the past. Alex, Leah said, it's not a bad thing, Alex continued. I just mean that they don't look like they're from today. They don't look modern. They're timeless, Leah said, as in they could be from any time. I liked them a lot, and I have to look a lot at photos for my job. The one with the little house with the Confederate flag mowed into the lawn, but kind of faded, and that big bird in the tree. It felt like it was about a political statement the flag was making, but also not about that at all. Just a photo of a house in a beautiful place with a strange looking bird. It felt like it was trying to zoom out on that house and put it in a context in a broader place, wherever that place was. Central Pennsylvania, Bernie said, where I'm from. Well, I liked that one, Alex said. <laughs> that one had a message, a takeaway. Violet looked up from their phone, which they had slid out of their thigh pocket. Leah knows things, they said to Bernie, about art. Not really, Leah said. I'm getting my PhD in media studies. I won't bore you with the details. But for extra money and because I'm interested, I also work for the city weekly paper. Mostly I just fact check, but I do a few reviews of shows now and then when they let me, some other short things. Mostly it's a lot of reading press releases and double checking the spellings of people's names. Violet's attention was back on their phone now, their thumb swiping powerfully. Volunteering, Alex continued. Principled consumption, ethical giving, reparations. <laughs> I like animals, Bernie said. I used to work at a shelter when I was in high school. Oh, that counts, Mina said. 
does it, Alex said. <laughs> I'll stop there. Yeah. That's amazing. Yay. Thanks, um, it's so great to be home. My mom is here in the front Aww. row. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi. Yes, clap. Um, she's from West Philly. I'm from West Philly. I was actually looking at her face while you were reading <laughs> <laughs> to see if she would get like the jokes because this is kind of a different West Philly than the one that we grew up with. Um, like my story is I was born in West Philly, lived there till around six, and then we moved to Mount Airy, Germantown, and then I you know, went to college, I left, I wasn't here for a long time, and I came back in 2015 to do a postdoc at Penn, so I was like, well, of course, I'm gonna live in West Philly again. Um, and so this professor at Penn was like, um, where'd you get a place? And I was like, 45th and Spruce. And she's like, um, aren't you afraid to walk home at night? Mm. And I had gotten a sense of the neighborhood and how it changed, so I said to her, I said, no, I'm not afraid of white lesbians. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, Incredible. Because I had sort of noticed that that, <laughs> that was an addition to West Philly, <laughs> that, <laughs> uh -huh. that it had become this kind of sort of like mecca for um, kind of, you know, lesbian subculture, and particularly these queer group homes mm -hmm. where this is set. Mm -hmm. I discovered that in 2015. Like, how did you <laughs> discover this sort of like queer home community, this lesbian community of West Philly? Yeah, totally. Okay, I love this, this story hour. Thank you. I didn't even know all of that. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, there's a big pipeline from Yield Trico, Haverford, Swarthmore, Bryn Mawr, um, friends. And uh, definitely folks moving into these big houses, I was aware of that happening. I didn't do that immediately. After graduation, I moved to West Virginia, where my first book is set, and had this whole like life-changing um, experience and like uh, whole journey there. And then I moved back to West Philly, and I was kind of like not sure where to live. And yeah, I was just was looking at these um, advertisements and I did actually have an interview not like not this in this exact interview but it was it was the spark honestly um, at a house that was like it was really interesting because it was kind of that sense of trying to like quantify your commitment to social justice in ways that were really interesting I hadn't really previously considered that as like part of a housing arrangement and then mm. I found like a much better fit with like lovely pals who are some of you who are here um and so but I kind of always remembered that interview and and I think I was always aware that there were like different sort of like microclimates of queer housing structures in the neighborhood some much more like radical and much more um sort of living by the values of like communal life and some much more sort of like don't run the AC above a certain temperature, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I lived yeah. it, honestly. Did you have, I mean, to that point, did you have any anxiety about sort of focusing on this kind of class of sort of white gentrifiers? Like, I just reviewed the new Claire Massoud novel. I reviewed it favorably, mm -hmm. but it focuses on the pied noirs in Algeria. And, like, my positive review got some pushback because people were like, no, it should focus on the Arab and Berber people of Algeria. Like, and I was sort of, I was like, no, but if you're going to critique, a com like, a community, you have to, like, focus on it. Like, it has to be kind of, like, the focal point. So I yeah. guess I was just sort of curious, like, kind of how you handled um, this issue of, like, who to represent if you do too much representing of the displaced community, does it then become sort of false to the perspective of these people who are living in this house, who yeah. are sort of cloistered amongst themselves? Yeah, and maybe that also, spe I mean, yes, is the answer I definitely had and have a lot of anxiety about it. And also I think that that also speaks to like sort of the point of um, satire and like yeah. the ways that it's like always really scary to write for an in-group knowing that those outside that group can potentially like weaponize those jokes and those loving sort of n little pokes and say like see this is why queers are you know terrible or whatever um, and I just had to kind of like so in that regard I was like okay I'm just like very clear that I'm writing for like intergroup thought thinking about about queer life rather than towards like a straight audience necessarily but in terms of the question of like 
anxiety about focusing on like white and Asian folks and multiracial folks in like gentrifying group houses. Yeah, I think that um, I like recently wrote this piece for Esquire and it kind of helped me like, uh, what's the word, like clarify what I wanted to say about it. And what I feel that I learned in my life, and I'm definitely a part of this group, is like that I think there's a strong sense of like guilt and shame for being part of gentrification to begin with. Thus, I think sometimes those like group house or neighborhood microclimate like judginess or like a rigidity of thought is sometimes a way to deal with that guilt and shame, mm -hmm. I think. And so that felt important to identify and like this, um, these like group houses again and this community that I'm a part of, like we exist and so I think that's important and valid to put on the page and it's what I have the most sort of ability to critique and be nuanced with. I don't have the lived experience of a lifelong West Philadelphian mm -hmm. or. I mean, because you yeah. don't want to be like that character, Alex in the book, who's a white <laughs> character, yeah. who goes on, who knocks on every single door on her block because she wants to make sure she has met every single black person on the block yeah. and like knows something about them. She like read an article that was like, you should go introduce yourself to her And I love yeah. the guy who just will not answer the yeah. door yeah. for her. <laughs> He's just like, yeah. He's mm -hmm. like, don't represent me. Like, you know, like, he don't, doesn't want to be perceived. He by doesn't her, want, yeah. don't perceive me. Don't yeah. perceive me. Totally. Um, I'm obsessed with this chore wheel <laughs> in the house. <laughs> Thank you. I uh -huh. mean, these people are upset. They're obsessed with equality and uh -huh. making sure everything is completely evenly split, that yeah. everyone's bringing the same amount of, you know, peanut butter and alcohol to the party. I mean, they're just like divvying everything up. Mm -hmm. Like, but you're sort of like gently mocking that, particularly like their obsession with, you know, equality itself, which is such yeah. an important term for queer people. Yeah. So, um, and so it's loaded to kind of mock it a bit, but can you say more about kind of why you felt like equality needed to be kind of, kind of yeah. made fun of a little bit? For sure, yeah. I mean, I think I'm interested in like a couple of like layers, like there's definitely that one and the idea that like, um, if we can make things equal in like a very external or like quantifiable way, they can be equal on the inside, which I think is like, as we know, it just like doesn't, it's not a thing. Um, so like Bernie comes from a different class background, but she's paying the same amount. Like, is that equal? No, you know? Um, and also I was really interested on this like other level. Of, so the book's like inspired and wants to think a lot about artistic duos, um, different, you know, a photographer and a, and a journalist. And it's inspired by uh, a real, queer woman couple, um, Bernice Abbott, the photographer, and her partner, Elizabeth McCausland. A lot of people have heard of Bernice Abbott if you're like a photo nerd, maybe. No one's heard of Elizabeth McCausland. So I was like really interested also in thinking about like inequality within a duo, within like an artistic partnership, and like what happens if one person gets more power, more status, more clout, right? And like thinking about the ways in which like it's never equal. It's never equal in a group. Like we cannot force it to be equal, right? Even though that's a worthy goal. And I think that speaks to like the beauty and the imagination of queer people is like our desire to try to like manifest an equal world. And also I think it's important that like we understand that um, that effort is worthy, but it's not the same as actual equality, right? And that there's no such thing, I think, especially in an artistic partnership where you're trying to make something, there's no such thing as equality, like what would that even look like? Mm -hmm. So I was trying to really, um, I guess kind of like drill down and offer a little bit of a sense of just like, what if we thought about equality in different ways? Like um, instead of equality, maybe thinking about, yeah, justice and love mm -hmm. more so. Mm -hmm. um, so like, why does Bernie want to live in this shore <laughs> wheel house? Like, so it's like, cause like Bernie has no time for any of this crap because she literally has no time. She has to work. She has like, to she's money, like, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm busy. I have two jobs. I have student loan debt. Yeah. Like, what is the attraction of the house for Bernie? Yeah, I think that she's very attracted to Leah from the bat, from the jump, from jump. Um, the part that I read where they meet at the door and Leah is this kind of like, she's charismatic, she's asking questions, she's really curious about Bernie, she's clearly very smart. Um, it's, I think, you know, there's some mix of like, is it sexual, is it friend, is it, you know, when your brain's just like attracted to someone else's brain, like I think that's, a thing that happens and um, is like a part of it for Bernie for sure. And then I think there's another part of it where she wants to be proximate to people who have like the privilege to make art for a living. Mm -hmm. And she's like, what would life be like if that were my life, you know? And she's mm -hmm. kind of like interested in seeing aesthetically what that would look like when she gets, I didn't read um, through it, but 
when she gets into the room, she's like, wow, this room is beautiful, Mm -hmm. you know? And she's like, there's original features from the (laughs) old Victorian house and the closets are nice and the view is interesting. And I just feel, she's like, I just feel interesting here. And I feel like it's an interesting background against Mm -hmm. which she can like make her art. So I think there's a sort of, um, yeah, a lot of reasons where it's sort of, it's a little bit like class aspirational and it's a little bit just like, chemical like there's sometimes there's just certain spaces where you want to be right and like makes you want to make things mm-hmm. so yeah. bernie is a photographer mm-hmm. lee is a journalist it's these two industries that are very much about attention yeah. who and what deserves our attention what we should focus on what we shouldn't focus on there's a really funny scene where leah is just sort of like running through all these different stories with her editor <laughs> and the editor you know she's like what about yeah. something on native american genocide i was like Pfft. No, come on, like, it's been done. Oh, God, yeah. Um, and so, so bad, like, yeah. you know, all these, like, really important stories. And then, you know, Leah's like, okay, what about this, like, lesbian haunted house? <laughs> um, yes. You know, and she's like, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Like, um, like, where did this, like, sort of come from for you? This sort of, you know, there's a lot of, like, media criticism in this book yes. as well. It turns out that, like, you just get interested in the same things over and over again in like all the projects that you're working on, right? So like, I think it's taken a couple of projects to identify that like, I'm very interested in writing about the media in a like absurd way. Like I really like um, thinking about the sort of like inside workings and the emotional dramas and the ways of, that are like false and also true and also really gross that make up the stories we get to see and consume. So yeah, Leah's like, that stuff is so real. Like I got, I'm very impressed, my editor let me keep this like long rant that's in this novel about essentially like the horrors of writing and pitching um, like clickbait journalism. And like, yeah, I've, I've really been told that. Like I've really been told by editors like, yeah, there was like a, sto- a piece I wrote about a missing black trans woman, and the editor was like, well, narratively, it would really be better if she was dead. And I was like, okay, thank you for that perspective. You know, like, there is, like, a real sense of, like, like, I think people's brains, like, rot a little bit. Sorry if anyone's a magazine editor, but, like, I think (laughs) it's, like, a real thing. It's a real thing. And Leah's, like, I think craving this ability to have, like, control, freedom, to be messy, to tell stories in ways that aren't determined by shock value or by what's going to, um, sort of attract the most viewership. And so they're, they're like playing and they have a real hunger, I think, with like different, for different kinds of attention, for mm-hmm. like a kind of attention that's not just slower, but like more nuanced, that's more, they, I think they both have a strong sense that they need to go away from this kind of like rigidity of common thought or like groupthink a little bit. And some of that is like, there's just a climate in which we're, we all like consume the same like 30 articles you know over mm-hmm. and over and that can be con- I find it difficult and I think yeah Leanne and Bernie are yeah. chafing under that a bit too the lesbian haunted house is oh, yes. a good story though yes yes I sorry mean, I forgot like, about the lesbian haunted house and so like yes. so like there's like a demonic Ellen DeGeneres who's like swimming <laughs> through like a pool of money um <laughs> Where yes. did that come from for yes. you? Okay, so for many in this room, I think, I know some people have really, really went to it. There was a couple of years ago, yes, people, I've seen some nods. There was a couple of years ago a traveling queer art exhibit called The Lesbian Haunted House. And um, I just got really excited about it. It's not like, um, none of, like, very few of the things that are in the book actually happened at the real Lesbian Haunted House. But it was a really, like, fun um idea to think about like what if you put two characters in a lesbian haunted house like how would that change this like developing chemistry between them you know and like it the lesbian haunted house in the novel is a lot about just kind of like yeah let's look at these sort of like archetypes of like evil lesbians and like see what they're up to and it provides like a really interesting it that's kind of like I mean like no spoiler well, like that's kind of like the place I think where Bernie and Leah are both like, whoa, we're both interested in this like random thing that's really a lot about like evil lesbians. Why are we both interested in that? None of our other housemates wanted to come to this. Why are we both here? So it sort of provides like a thing for both of them to bounce off of, I think, that like crystallizes their connection to each other. Yeah. Um, and so Bernie is a photographer, yeah. but it's a particular kind of photography mm-hmm. called large format mm-hmm. photography. Um, it seems sort of similar to what Leah is interested in, this kind of taking a bigger kind of frame. Yeah. Is that, am I making the right connection? Am I being too literal? No, no, okay. totally. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting because, like, I had to do a lot of um, learning and research about large format, which is basically just, like, 
a very slow, very large, like, piece of glass. And actually, you can, the thing that I found fascinating about it is that a large format camera can actually see more detail than the human eye can see. I know, oh, that was so fun. <laughs> ah, yes. And I was like, this is fascinating. And I learned about it because the real um, historical inspiration, she used a large format camera, and it was like, her whole mission was like to document and to like, she was like a realist. She was like, I'm going to record what's really, what you can really see. But I also it has that tension there, because it's like, then what's real? Is it what the camera sees or what the eye sees, right? And I thought that tension was so interesting. And also, I, I was kind of like, hmm, like, what would motivate a person now in like, the book is set in 2018, basically. What would motivate a person in 2018 to use a camera that's that difficult and arduous and finicky? And it kind of has this like reputation of being like the camera for the great masters, like Ansel Adams and um, all these folks that we sort of see like on postcards. They use like large format, right? So I think there was a sense of like, okay, what if this like young queer woman was like, no, I'm gonna master this like fucking old format, right? Mm -hmm. And and then I think there's something also very like um, a little bit, uh, it's extremely ambitious and I'm also always attracted and interested in ambitious people. So I think there was something about like, what if you widen the frame, like a little bit in that excerpt, like mm -hmm. I think Le Leah's really interested in like, what if the frame got wider? So we're seeing, we're just like seeing more, we're including more mm -hmm. rather than like with your iPhone, which only includes, um, sort of, you know, what you're, uh, what, you're actually, what you're sort of already prone to look at. Mm -hmm. A large format camera makes us notice more, I think. Yeah. So they drive around central Pennsylvania to yeah, take these the photos state, yeah. to document. I was saying to you before, it seems like the lesbian road story is having a moment. Uh, yes. Drive away dolls, love lies bleeding love lies a bit bleeding, in yeah. the end. Um, like, uh, there's the obvious kind of Thelma and Louise parallel, but I was just yes. kind of like wondering why you think it's kind of this enduring kind of symbol for lesbians. Yeah, we've been texting about this and voice memoing a little bit because Jen is a really genius critic and was prompting was thinking me to, of working on something on like the me to think about it too. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I mean I don't know number one. No one knows. <laughs> but I think um, I think I always come back to that moment in Thelma and Louise if people are familiar. Um, great work of cinema, Kelly Corey, Stan. And it's like there's this moment when um, they've been on the road a long time. So for anyone that doesn't know, there's like a, a sexual assault and a murder and beginning of Thelma and Louise, and then they have to flee. And there's a moment when um, Thelma, played by Gina Davis, is like, she's like, looks like hell, right? Like they haven't showered, they're dirty, et cetera. And Thelma's like, something's crossed over in me and I can't go back. And I was like, ah. Oh, it's so good, you know? And so I made all these like charts and graphs of Thelma and Louise, and I was like, I wanna write something like Thelma and Louise. How does it work? Let's analyze. And then I was like, I already wrote a book about murder. I can't do that. And then I was like, well, so I think what has to happen is you need, a, you need something else that's going to propel the story through, that's going to trigger that moment of something's crossed over in me and I can't go back. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the relationship between Bernie and Leah. So I took that as kind of like the central force where I was like, that's the thing that's gonna have to deepen at every stop or with every like hot Brad Pitt they meet or whatever. Like it's gonna have to deepen over and over and over again. But so I think there might be something about like be two like AFAB people or like women and non-binary people in a car is just inherently gay. No. I don't know why, I can't explain it. <laughs> I can't explain it. I think there's something about the intimacy that develops in a contained space. Um, as you are becoming more and more in tuned to the changing world that feels, it just feels so intense. And um, things that are intense in a car are gay. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I don't make the rules, yeah. <laughs> so while they're, in, while they're in the car, speaking of that, so while they're in the car, they, they listen to Delilah ah, yes. and are crying. Okay, do people know Delilah? Yes, okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. It was so great to see Delilah in a road Delilah novel. Like that's yeah. exactly what I would be doing a long road trip. I'd be listening to Delilah Absolutely. and crying and yeah. pressing the like evocative seek button yes. on the radio. Seek, yeah. Uh, yeah. Which you have, you like, there's a play on like sort of seek, like what are we seeking? You know, I love it. It was just really great. Um, I was curious like what road novels you read to kind of prepare for this and also to sort of figure out how yeah. you wanted to do it differently. Thank you. First of all, Delilah representation. Yeah, if people don't know, she's an amazing, <laughs> like, bizarre syndicated, um, like, radio call-in program that you can access, like, anywhere all over the United States. 
is my understanding. Like I drove all over the United States and I could access Delilah in each and every state. And she only has like five songs that she plays over and over again. <laughs> yeah. And it's like people will call in and be like, it'll be like, I, Jen, my friend Jen and I are having a fight and I don't know what to do. And she'll be like, I have the song for you. And it's just like the Golden Girls song, like each and every time. <laughs> like there's only one, you know, and then a romance song. Anyway, so I, I wanted to like, bring in those things that were really meaningful to me and were sort of part of like the fabric of going on a road trip. It's, it's that intimacy, it's the um, things that get said in uh, like, you know, halfway or two thirds into the road trip that end up being the things that are sort of unsayable often or unsayable in other contexts in our life, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was that kid at like age 12 who had that like um, Jack Kerouac poster that was like the only people for me are the mad ones anybody like it's like an on the road quote you know so like that's all I had at 12 was like Jack Kerouac he was like mm. you know whatever that was the road novel and so which they made into a terrible movie with Kristen Stewart mm -hmm. <laughs> um, even Kristen Stewart couldn't save it and um, <laughs> yeah I was thinking about like what would a queer what would what a queer road novel look like. And it's really The Price of Salt for me. It's just like Patricia Highsmith did it first and did it better. So I also reread and like spent a bunch of time with The Price of Salt and looked at like how, yeah, why did they go on the road? How long does it take them to get out there? Because my book's really only about a third on the road. It's a, the first third is in West Philly in the group house. Second third's on the road. And then the last third is kind of like the fallout of their road trip, et cetera. Um, and I also read a couple of other sort of non-traditional road trip books. Like I'm pretty obsessed with this book, um, uh, Brother and Sister Enter the Forest by Richard Mirabella, which is a sibling novel, which I feel like we don't have enough of. And it's about trauma, and it kind of looks at a past road trip that was taken that sort of expl or like explains, not really, but like speaks to what's going on in the present. So I was looking at like what happens temporally if you make the road trip not going forward in time. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a big structure nerd, and I tried a lot of different ways to make it work. But ultimately, I was like, I think you need the time in Philly to set up, like, why do they need to leave? What are they looking for? Bernie's also dealing with this like professor who was like creepy and weird and left her this estate. That's kind of like the reason they get out the door. Um, so I was also looking for like in other road trip texts, like why are they even going? What's the point? Like if they're not running from a murder, what are they going towards? Yeah. <laughs> and most of those, te the texts that I found that were queer, like Imogen Benny's in Nevada as well is another great one. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like that was, those are really fun because it's like essentially a lot of those novels are just I'm, I'm going out the door to see what's out there, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a more queer, more honest telling, yeah. And there's also something about sort of how the roadside diner yeah. can become a charged experience for a fat character. There's a fat phobic attack at one of the kind of greasy spoon places that they stop at. That also feels like a way that you're pushing the road novel to be yeah. something. That's true, that's true. Yeah, I, I wanted the um, people that they encounter on the road who are mostly like, yeah, rural folks who are living in like smaller towns and stuff in, in PA, I didn't want those people to be like throwaway characters or villains or like the idea of being like urban people gawk at like poor white people. That's also not, um, definitely not what I want to do. Like I I'm tried to be very thoughtful about that. And, um, but at the same time, I think there's like a really interesting intersection between like fat people and travel. There's been a, a lot of cool um, sort of developments in the fat travel space that I've been watching. Like there's some really cool, uh, like Ronald Young Jr. does this podcast, Wait For It. This is a lot about being a fat person who travels. And we know that like folks of color, fat people, trans people don't have the same kind of like traveling like ease and mobility, right? There's a lot of like proximity to danger if you're in any of those identities. So um, they're both white people. Leah is fat and mask and um, it, like has a different kind of presence in a lot of these spaces. And Bernie's also from the plate or like from around there. So there's a different kind of access, but Leah, yeah, has this like fat phobic thing happen to her. And I wanted to show a character who is fat, whose body is not a problem, whose body is not um, the thing that her character is grappling with like over the course of the book. Like, so Leah doesn't like lose weight by the end of the book. She's still fat. And also she doesn't like come to some huge acceptance at the end of the book. She isn't like, and now I love myself and it's over, right? Like there, she's, she's actively grappling. She's thinking about fatness. She's thinking about embodiment. She also is really like sexy and very good at sex, which I wanted to give her because fat people have glorious sex. And, and also Bernie is struggling with her own embodiment stuff. Like she's, um, She's thin, but she's really dissociated, and she doesn't know how to be like present in her body in a way that's satisfying sexually. And so I, I wanted to like give moments for 
Bernie to be able to show up to Leah, like when Leah has this like fat phobic attack with a hot dog, spoiler, in the diner. And um, it's not dangerous, dangerous, but it's bad. And then I wanted Leah to also be able to show up for Bernie in moments of like sexual intimacy and them figuring out like what it feels like to be close in those moments so that like both characters kind of got to be the, not the savior, but sort of the, the teacher, mm -hmm. which I think maybe speaks to like a different kind of equality in the relationship, yeah. Um, I have other questions, but we need to make sure we have time for questions from the audience. The oh question gosh. for the podcast, I have to repeat it for the yes, podcast. Yes, for the podcast. Is, uh, are Emma's nails painted to look like the book cover? Yeah, hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you only get your uh, first novel once, so thank you for noticing. Yeah. <laughs> I have a great nail witch we can discuss. Yeah. What was it like making the transition from nonfiction to fiction? That's a great mm. question. Thank you. What was it like transitioning from fiction, nonfiction to fiction? Totally. Um, yes, so I did and I didn't because I um, would say that like fiction is my first love. Like I didn't even really know I don't think we had, like, we had biographies in my house, but, like, I don't think that I, ha like, read a nonfiction book until I was, like, 26. Like, I didn't know. I thought books were novels. Novel equals book. Book equals novel, you know? And um, so it was this, like, very interesting process where I started out in fiction, actually, like, got my MFA in fiction. That was kind of my first love. And then um, during grad school, I got very galvanized by this, like, very specific time period that was happening and all the things that would sort of become like the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville were happening before that when I was in grad school and I kind of just felt like I couldn't like go into the door or I couldn't just like go into my room and close the door and be like I'm writing my little stories now you know like I felt like this kind of like burning sense that I wanted to be part of some larger conversation which I realized you could do in nonfiction. And I also, um, then I started to get curious and like think a lot about uh, this project I was working on, which I thought was fiction, that became The Third Rainbow Girl as nonfiction. Um, but people get really confused. <laughs> like there's still a whole world out there in the sort of industry and in publishing where people are like, wait, but you wrote a nonfiction book and now this is a novel. Like how does, the math isn't mathing, you know? And I'm like, see like generations of people who came before us who, who move back and forth very fluidly between many genres. Um, like it's, it just, I think it didn't used to be that weird. I don't know, Grace Paley is one of my heroes. She wrote fiction, nonfiction, poetry, kind of badly, but she like, but fiction and nonfiction like very well. And, and so I, I think it's, um, I also think I can tell that there's some things that are common between the two genres. Like, like I said, I was sort of joking before, like the obsession with the media and storytelling is present in both books, this kind of sense of like, what are the stakes of telling a story? How is the story told and why? Um, and then I think like my nonfiction makes my fiction um, hopefully more sturdy and more um, sort of, mm, I don't know, like topical question mark. And then I think my fiction makes my nonfiction hopefully funnier and um, just have like, I think fiction like lets me have fun on the sense level in nonfiction. And I, there's so many nonfiction books I read that I'm like, the topic's really interesting, but like I cannot read this because it's written in like nonfiction voice, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, just give me a little something, a little pizzazz or something, you know? So I think, I think they feed each other. I actually think being working in two genres makes them both um, hopefully better. Yeah. yeah. Did I ever tell you that Cheryl Strayed ran into Grace Paley at a rest stop? <laughs> like speaking of road books, just like randomly, she was and she saw her. She was like, "Can that be Grace Paley?" And she was. And it like, was. She was like, "Are you Grace Paley?" She was like, "Yes." Was like <laughs> She's pretty unmistakable. She has that like white fro, do fro, yeah. yeah. When you're when you start writing, what is like your way in? Mm -hmm. Like um, character, voice, plot, yeah, like language. Totally, thank you. Um, I think it depends, but mostly image and voice, I think. Like, I think that I'm a very, um, like, image-driven person, and so when I learned that, like, these real queer folks had uh, gone on this road trip, so it was, a, again, photographer, art writer, in 1935, they went on this road trip throughout Southeast America, and I, I saw these like ledgers that they had kept that Elizabeth McCausland, the writer, had kept, and it was like um, <laughs> it was so cryptic because like clearly they were having a lot of sex, and um, <laughs> it was like Elizabeth McCausland was like uh, Bernie danced with a little Maryland girl 
that's it. Like the le like the ledger for that day, or it would be like 185 miles, like two frames, because like that's what Bernie shot, and you know frames. And I was like, so that image of the ledger was very like ooh to me, you know. I was just like, I want to learn. I want to know like into what life does that image come that makes it intense. So I think image and then voice is like I think once I got Bernie's voice sort of down, she has this like a little bit um, kind of like grumpy, like <laughs> irreverent voice. And that was kind of what I went f went forward using. I was like, I think that's that's the anchor. And I think you got to know like what jokes will your character make? What makes them really sad? Um, how do they have sex? What do they do at a party? And um, like, what do they like to eat? And I feel like once I kind of like figured out who Bernie was in those ways, it was easier for me to find her, her voice, yeah. Kind of curious if you could speak a little bit more on like uh, you said the novel's written in like 2018, which feels like a million years ago. It's like Trump, yeah. first Trump era, sort of like what does it mean uh, the novel mean in like a political in terms of the political landscape, especially yeah. in West Philly with all of these like leftists that are arguing with each other. <laughs> <laughs> Heard of it? Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. I I wasn't sure. I I knew that I I wanted to set the book in 2018, and I wasn't fully sure why at the beginning. I just kind of had like a a hunch, and I think it was, so I, I, I was really like writing it in earnest in like 2021, 20, 22, and like there was, yeah, I feel like 2018 was such a simple time now. <laughs> in retrospect, it's like we were halfway through the Trump presidency and we didn't know like how much worse it was gonna get, you know? And I feel like there was still this sense of like, we, it could be saved, like America could be saved maybe, you know, if we like fought hard enough and like went into the convention center and boarded up the doors, like maybe, you know? And um, now, no. Yeah, and, and I think that I wanted to like, I was really interested in um, the idea of like documenting a time before everything changes, you know? Mm -hmm. And what is last when we lose um, those kind of like flashpoint moments. And I think also there was like so much rhetoric about rural places being like to blame for Trump, like it's their fault, like it's rural people's fault. They're voting against their own interests, whatever. And I wanted to say like, okay, but what if it's actually like the same kinds of systems of thought that like are operating in rural places operate in even like marginalized spaces? What if the same kinds of like power dynamics are playing out? What would that look like? Um, so I think, yeah, I wanted to give a sense of like a time before everything changed um, to document that. And, and then I allow sort of Bernie and Leah to, to imagine a future, but there's a part in the book where I'm just like, you can tell, like, me, the author, I'm just like, I don't know. Like, I literally don't know what's coming next. You know, at this point, like, none of us know what's coming next, right? And that sense of sort of, like, the future is literally blank was something I want. I wanted the book to meet that sense of the future is blank, um, if that makes sense, yeah. Hello. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I loved hearing you talk about... Um, road trips and like you getting obsessed with the, the structure of the, like the road trip book and, yeah. all, and movie and all of that. Um, and also loved hearing you say that anything intense that happens in a car is gay because <laughs> as a queer horror fan, yes, that's exactly what it happens. It just feels um, right. right. Yeah. But I'm wondering if you could speak to, and I think like obviously there are very real reasons why the inspiration of the book like put this on the road, but if you could speak to what's different about like the sense of maybe it's intimacy or something in a road novel specifically mm -hmm. rather than like a travel novel, like something that would happen on a train or in a plane or like yeah. anything else. Yeah, oh good, interesting point. Yeah, I think um, why are road novels special, like particularly car travel? I think there's something about the speed that cars go and the speed that like the human mind processes or something. It's like the right speed to process things in a slightly, like, it's like to like metabolize, if that makes sense. Um, and I think there's also like just a sense of extreme confinement in a car. That's not the case on like public transport airplanes. Although I do often have a lot of like feelings on airplanes. Um, I get like airplane sadness, I think. Uh, you know, it takes off and you're like, ah, mortality. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think there's something about, yeah, it's like I wanted them, I knew they were gonna talk about like, have you had an abortion? I knew they were gonna talk about um, their relationship to like men and penises. Like I knew they were gonna talk about like all these things that 
they just wouldn't have the space or ability to talk about like passing each other in the hall on the way to the bathroom. You know, again, there's something so like strange and interesting about the housemate relationship where like they're not your lover, they're not your sister, they're not your friend exactly. They sort of are, but they also aren't. So I think there was something about that intense, like almost like the um, limits of what you can talk about are taken away and there's literally no one else there you're just like hella bored too sometimes like there's a <laughs> boredom can be productive I think I think there's a productive boredom that kicks in on road trips that doesn't kick in on um, train or plane bus trips yeah um, uh, how did thinking about a photographer and I haven't gotten to read it yet I'm very yeah. excited to get it. how did thinking about a photographer and, and seeing like a photographer did it how did it or if it did change how you see in your day-to-day -day life or, or seeing it. And I just want to say windshields always kind of feel like cameras a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah, to me, yeah. Or maybe not to you, but how, so how did it change? That's like a natural fit, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I to put my wonderful partner on the spot. Like, we kind of, like, independently went on this journey with film photography, each of us. So I've been seeing art develop their own film as well. So like this book started a few years ago and then like you've been interested in photography. And I feel like whenever I go out with art and they're taking pictures, I become like so much more attuned to the, just to the act of looking, you know, like just to look at something is a kind of, like there's just more layers of looking that open up when I think you have specifically a, a film camera, again, because of the way you have to like interact, I think, with it as a human in, in technology. Um, and I did for this book do like a bunch of shadowing of a large format, um, female large format photographer who's really wonderful, whose name is Jade Doskow. Who's, she's the photographer in residence at Fresh Kills, the um, park in Staten Island that used to be a landfill. And it's, it's really cool. It's, and it's open to the public now. You should go. It's very beautiful. The remains of 9-11 were scattered there. It's like a haunted Whoa. place. But beautiful. And her job is to document its change over time from a landfill into a um, park, which is really cool. And so she's been taking these photographs of the same place for like 10 years. And yeah, I just noticed watching her, like the way that she would, how slow the process was and how easily like bungled it was. Like there's a sense of like, um, you can make a quote-unquote mistake and you won't be able to see the mistake until you develop the photo. I thought that was really beautiful, that there's like these sort of serendipitous ways that the process teaches you um, what the project is. And like, yeah, I feel like that I have to like, acknowledge too, like pal Annie Leontis like, interviewed me and that was your idea, I think, Annie. You were like, is a novel like a large format photograph? And I was like, fuck, yeah, I think so. You know, like the sense of like... Um, it's you don't know what you're making exactly, and it's the process, the thing that teaches you. So photography felt like a really useful like metaphor for that, I guess, since I'm not a real photographer. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, throughout your pro uh, process of writing, I was wondering if there's any parts where you found yourself surprised by yourself, either, wow, I did that, or, oh, wow, I didn't expect that to happen. Yeah, and I wanna say, will you answer this one with me too? Do you have any surprising things that have happened to you in a piece recently? And then I'll answer. Uh, wait, could you repeat? I didn't know I was going to be answering. Sorry, Jen. <laughs> you just answer. Things that have surprised you. No, part of anything that surprised you in your recent writing. Like something you didn't expect to happen. That, it, that, it, that I finished on time. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. All right. We'll take it. Um, yes, yeah, so many surprises. I think... Um, this book changed like so much from the thing that was like sold into capitalism and the thing that you're holding in your hand. Like I had so many editors, I had four editors on this book, which is like wild in and of itself. It's a story for cake. And um, I also had uh, just no idea how to write a novel when I started. I think I thought that a novel was like you know, like the Western Aristotelian thing where it's like it goes up and more shit happens and then it comes down. You know, I didn't know how to shape it and the process for me was so much like you go into the woods and then you look back and you're like, oh, like where was the last time that I knew what I was doing? So it was a constant process of like turning around and backtracking. So if anyone's working on a novel here, maybe that resonates, hard to say. But like I think there was just a sense that I thought that I could control the elements and you just absolutely cannot. And I didn't know um, who was gonna tell the story so that I like being that um, 
comes into the novel often, mostly in the beginning and end, but sometimes in the middle too. She kind of like knows things about Bernie and Leah that it's sort of not really possible to know. She's kind of like a little bit opinionated and pushy. And um, she came in for me as a total surprise. Like I didn't know who, I thought that the story was gonna be like, a nice, simple, close third novel, you know, just mwah. And then I was like writing one day and this first person voice like started talking and I was, and the, with the first lines of the novel, like where I live now, there is no art. And I was like, who's that? <laughs> you know, and it would have been much easier to be like, oh, like I'm halfway through this novel, like go away, you know. Mm -hmm. But it felt important, like it really did feel like I was like knocking and wanting to come in. And I'm not like that woo woo person, but it was a very, um, almost spiritual experience where I was like, this first person narrator wants to be a part of the book. Why? What are they interested in? And so then I had to figure out like why. And then I think that's the character who's really asking the question like, can art save your life? Like what's the point of even doing this? You know? Yeah. Um, and so I hope that gives the book like a little more layering than just like a story of two like grumpy queers. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah thank you. Mom, do you have a question? <laughs> For Jen. When am I moving back to Philly? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we all um, want to know the answer. This is that, such but. a sweet, quirky, funny, just homey novel. I felt like I got to be in your brain like your housemate for a time, and it was, I loved living with you. Uh, so thank you. Congrats. Uh, let's so cheer. Sweet. Thank Emma. you all so much. Yeah. Thank you, Jen.